um, make, okay, just wanna make sure everything is as it should be. Okay. Can I get some confirmation as to whether you guys can hear me? Can't hear you, Doug. Great. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started. You had um, a little bit of a uh, homework assignment uh, during your lunch break. So as I, as you heard, uh, it was a very brief report on a study from the University of Virginia. Um, I wonder, excuse me, I'm sorry. I wonder about your thoughts. Um, so feel free to speak on the microphone or type on the chat um, and just want to know what questions, thoughts, ideas arose from having heard what you heard. Uh, sounds like we may have an unmuted microphone. I hear some background noise. All right, Heather says, very interesting, astonishing. Say more. What were you surprised to hear about? What were some of the um, thoughts that you had about whether how this plays out and, you know, in the provision of health care? Right. Um, so your your thought was, you know, the idea that medical professional can have this thought that, you know, the stereotypes uh, permeate uh, to folks who are who have a higher level of education, you know, specifically who are training to be medical professionals. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts? Reactions? To what you heard? I just thought it was pretty, uh, uh, I guess, sort of to hear the idea that they had like uh, extra muscle, that they'd be jumping, running, such a level of ignorance, I, I'm just kind of really perplexed. Uh, indeed, yeah. It is pretty, um, I mean, astonishing is the word, you know, fl I'm flabbergasted the first time I read that um, or heard that report. Uh, and looked more into it. I mean, just those ideas um, to be, you know, to be thought of, believed on in the 21st century um, is just amazing. Um, Carmen says, I think that the assumption that a racial group would have different experience was surprising. Uh, yeah, different experience of, of pain, thicker skin, um, higher immunity, you know, just insane. Um, uh, again, in this day and age. Um, Eddie Taylor says, I have reviewed some of this research which has been presented nationally. Um, Eddie, can you tell us more about that? And you know, what are some additional pieces that maybe were not presented in this short um, uh, snippet that, uh, that you think it would be worthwhile for, for our group? Um, this is also part of the reason that some Blacks have a lack of trust towards the medical profession. This information goes back to the Tuskegee ex experiment. Yeah, I mean, I think you brought up the, you know, the one issue, uh, if you know, if not the central one, potentially 
uh, you know, very close to the central one um, is that, you know, be, uh, health disparities that are based on many, many factors, not the least of which is distrust of the system um, by the minority or the population that, you know, where we are considering based on their, you know, uh, ba based on the lack of knowledge and information, the misbeliefs and misconceptions um, and mistreatment. Um, that they, you know, experience undertreatment, mistreatment, um, that they, you know, those groups have experienced um, because of, you know, because of beliefs like this and because of issues like this. Uh, Kirsten said, sad to see that some of the old racial preconceptions, biases regarding ability are carrying over as well as morphing into concepts, concepts that different people have different abilities, solely on color, ethnic origin. Um, yeah, absolutely. And again, you know, um, how, how that translates into the interaction with, you know, in one-on-one -on -one interactions with patients um, or system level interactions with a group of, you know, patients, specifically a minority group, uh, could be disheartening. Um, Dr. Gupta says, uh, what was most surprising to me was that they noted that even black medical professionals are subject to this bias against black patients. Yes, indeed. Uh, again, you know, it just it comes to show that we, none of us are, you know, except, exempt uh, from biases and that those, you know, again, beliefs, misbeliefs uh, can permeate not just the uh, the, you know, social environments that we grow up in, but the, you know, professional environments that we are a part of, you know, and uh, highlights, uh, if nothing else, you know, as I mentioned before, the need for cultural and uh, culturally competent um, training in medical professionals and allied medical professionals, which is significantly lacking. Um, Carmen says we need more minority applicants and students who will become providers and professors of medicines. Uh, indeed, um, Janelle says as a Costa Rican of African descent, I often uh, the most resist. Um, say, um, I'm in most resistant from other than uh, identify as Latino and African American. Yes, um, indeed. Um, and, and again, you know, it's just, uh, you guys have captured a lot of, you know, the thoughts and comments that I had when I read this piece. Um, Dr. Gupta says, but then some of Malcolm Gladwell's research suggests both whites and blacks have implicit bias against black people. Um, and it's true, and I think it's fair to say that we all have implicit bias against, you know, uh, 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 certain groups um, in our implicit yeah, you know, our awareness, obviously uh, implicit, indicates that we may not totally be aware of these biases um, and that, um, you know, but we do know that they affect us all um, in unique and, and significant ways. Um, yeah, um, absolutely, excellent feedback. So, you know, I take you back to, you know, what I said before about uh, the Ohio Psychological Association supporting, as one of the many agencies, not the only one, uh, support, excuse me, supporting a move for professional, um, for continuing education uh, to be, um, in, in health professionals to include cultural competence. And, and once again, the resistance from the medical association and other areas and other professional organizations in that regard. So if this study, um, if this report and the, you know, the points that you guys have made, uh, do, you know, do not illustrate the need for people to, you know, for people in the healthcare uh, environment uh, to become more culturally competent, um, I don't know what does, you know, but I certainly, um, again, just wanted to make sure to highlight some of the, the problems that we have um, and how persistent and um, some and even resistant uh, they are to change based on people's ideas and, and knowledge and biases and, um, and um, lack of awareness and lack of um, understanding, um, a lack of, you know, sensitivity um, about dealing with those issues. So you could see how, again, um, a certain populations and individuals from those populations uh, will feel alienated and isolated um, and mistrustful um, and uh, um, have a lot of reluctance 
uh, to engage with the medical profession um, based on, you know, based on those experiences. All right. Good. Um, I hope that was worth your, your time. And we'll, you know, there's, I want to examine um, several of the issues that I think are relevant to our, you know, our, our best understanding of um, um, ethnic and uh, transcultural uh, differences and, you know, things that you may encounter uh, in therapeutic um, and, you know, in a therapeutic setting um, so that you keep it could be better informed and more sensitive about um, issues that you, uh, your patients present. Eddie Taylor says that this information is sad and morbid. Charles Drew, who developed blood transfusions, was not allowed to receive the treatment due to the hospital where he was um, to receive treatment was a white hospital. Um, Yes, um, and you know more example. I mean, there's plenty uh, more examples, unfortunately, like that. Um, some of which, you know, I'm going I'm to share with you as we talk to other different types of individuals, um, other groups and in, in class and in, in, um, cultural uh, backgrounds um, uh, to, you know, help you understand that we truly do have a not not separate but equal. Uh, but in many ways separate and very unequal uh, sources of care uh, for minority individuals. Uh, all right, um, thank you for your inputs. Um, feel free to add anything if you would like. Um, again, I hope that was worth uh, your time. If not, you know, if sad and, and morbid, um, also potentially eye-opening um, as well. All right, so prior to the break, we were talking about phenotyping and genotyping and polymorphisms and how they manifest and you know the prevalence, uh, relative prevalence rates um, in different populations. And so now we wanna talk about the, the so what, you know, so what do we do? Uh, we know that many polymorphisms uh, show ethnic differences, um, but we also know, as I mentioned before, that the overlap is great enough to limit its usefulness in individual patients. And at the end of the day, when we talk about pharmacogenomics, uh, again, the, the goal is individualized medicine, individualized therapies uh, that, uh, that would prove useful and safe uh, for individual patients. So uh, what do we do? And you know, I just wanna emphasize this, remember this? Uh, we have a genetic predisposition that makes us who we are, but then we also have a genetic expression uh, that, is, that is affected by multiple um, factors, multiple areas of, you know, potential uh, stress and trauma, as well as, you know, growth uh, and development and uh, privilege or, um, or um, positivity <clears throat> that could, you know, um, make it so that the patient that is sitting across your desk or across your office, um, you know, could, could react one way or another uh, or a very different way um, to the medication or the pharmacotherapy that you're trying to provide. So before we go any further, we're gonna talk about phenotyping and genotyping next, but I wanna ask you uh, a poll question. So let's go ahead and <clears throat> pull up question number six, if you don't mind.
All right, I think we have a good number of you that have responded, so I'm going to close the poll and share the results. <clears throat> and the question is 99% of all pharmace pharmaceutical or pharmaceuticals are metabolized by CYP3A4 and 16%, uh, so um, the minority of you uh, stated that was true. 84% of you stated that was uh, false, um, which is the correct answer. So 84% um, uh, of you uh, had the correct answer, which is false. And if you recall, I did have disparate information, which I'm going to fix uh, and make sure to clarify right now. Uh, one slide I think said, so this slide, let me stop sharing so you could see the slide. Um, this slide said about 40 to 45% of medications uh, were me metabolized by 3A4. The most um, um, correct or the most, yeah, the most accurate um, information comes from slide um, 97. Uh, which says that 60% of all pharmaceuticals are metabolized by 3A4. So 99% was not the correct answer, um, but it is a large number of medications that are typically metabolized by the 3A4. So uh, there we go. Thank you for participating. And now we'll take us back to slide number 105, or rather 106, as we move forward. Um, so um, before we start talking about genotyping, um, I am curious to, um, to find out in the settings that you work with or the refer, uh, the, the consultants that you use or referral sources uh, that you have uh, for uh, patients who are using psychotropic medications, uh, whether or not the use of uh, uh, genetic test is widely um, established. Uh, so maybe uh, just say yes in the chat box if it's being used uh, routinely in your practice or in a practice that you're familiar with um, or no, if that's uh, not the case. Okay. Okay. So I think um, what I'm seeing is a majority uh, say no. We have Rebecca who has seen the use and a pediatric psychiatrist. Uh, Carmen says there might be a change to have more of it in, um, in your current practice setting. Angela says not, not in your practice, but in a practice that you refer to. Okay. So this, uh, qu the next question is specifically uh, for Rebecca, Angela, and, and Carmen. What are some of the things that you've seen? Can you give me an example of a patient uh, where it was used and how it was used, potentially just the, you know, whether it was used for, for anticipating what prescription to give and whether it was uh, uh, value added? Okay, so Rebecca says use for what antidepressant to use. So the prediction of um, efficacy would be the uh, the takeaway from that. Um, Angela says class a client was not responding to a number of SSRIs. So uh, potentially again for the prediction of efficacy. Uh, Carmen says there is no research that suggests that some symptoms are genetically influenced. Um, interesting. Okay, good points. So uh, the consensus at this time is that genotyping is it's too, uh, too perhaps too new, although not as new now as it was, you know, uh, when this was uh, written. As um, it, it may be not, it may be too subject to uh, variability uh, to to be uh, recommended for widespread uh, use or for uh, or to significantly be able to you know predict safety and efficacy um, of um, uh, prescriptions and there are some limitations associated with genotyping which I will talk about uh, that make you uh, sort of think twice or you know potentially consider uh, whether um, to go forward at this point or to recommend it at this point. 
So genotyping is specifically a blood sample analysis of, of specific genetic alleles. Uh, it can also be done through um, other um, uh, 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 body fluids such as saliva, um, et cetera. Uh, the standard approach, um, um, you know, the, the idea behind genotyping is that the standard approach of start, lo start low and go slow uh, and get blood levels is fine, but with genetic testing, prescribing could be tailored to the individual. So I've already given you the, the example of a recommendation for genetic uh, testing or genotyping um, Asians, uh, especially Han Chinese, for the presence of a specific allele that would make it make treatment with a carbamazepine actually dangerous. Um, and that would be an example, as I mentioned before, of genotyping for safety as opposed to efficacy. I think uh, Rebecca had a comment, the pediatricians did not appreciate this because their patient could not get meds until the test return. Oh, wow, interesting. How was it, um, who was denying uh, the medications? Was it, uh, are you saying that they would not prescribe until they had the genetic testing uh, available? Or are you saying that the sources of uh, uh, reimbursement, such as the insurance comp companies, were demanding uh, genetic testing? Okay, more to come on that. So far, the um, FDA has generally chosen to include pharmacogenetic information um, relevant to rare, severe, adverse events on drug labels. So you will not find drug labels, you know, that say recommend genetic uh, testing or genotyping uh, before using this drug to determine if it's going to be efficacious. More than likely, you'll see the uh, recommendation from the FDA uh, that the genotyping should be done to determine whether the medication would be safe uh, to use. Um, and that has happened even when the associations between the variant and the drug uh, response has not been replicated. So, you know, the idea, of course, is that if there is a potential danger, uh, we want to warn prescribers of potential risk, especially when the risk is uh, severe. Uh, so, of course, this places the burden on clinicians to use their own judgment regarding the need for pharmacogenetic testing before prescribing a medication. Um, in contrast with unreplicated tests for association, are prospective trials of genotyping to avoid uh, adverse pharmacogenetic effects. And, you know, there are some, uh, but not enough of this information. Um, available uh, for clinicians to be able to use. Uh, so there are several types of genotyping devices, and once again, I'm going to make sure to uh, say that I have no financial affiliations with any of these uh, devices or any of the, the companies that produce uh, these devices. And because we don't routinely use uh, genotyping in my practice or in the, in the government in general, um, I can't really say whether or not um, you know, any of them tend to be uh, better than the others. The one thing that I would say, the one the things that I want to share with you uh, have to do with pricing and, the, you know, potential sample reports and that sort of thing, uh, just so you have an awareness of how these things uh, may work. Um, so probably the, uh, not probably, uh, definitely the oldest genotyping device is the Ampli, Ampli chip, uh, which you guys saw a graph, uh, you know, before that was um, based on the Ampli chip. Uh, um, marketing materials. Um, it was uh, it was uh, geared toward phenotyping for polymorphisms and multiple copies copies of cytochrome P450, 2D6, and 2C19, which, as you know, have been um, are the two uh, most commonly uh, most common uh, P450 enzyme uh, systems in the um, metabolism of medications, pharmaceuticals in general, uh, but also the most subject to genetic polymorphisms. Um, so, you know, one finding from the Ampli chip is that the five to 10% of most populations who lack normal 2D6 alleles are poor metabolizers of tricyclics and typical antipsychotics, 
while those with three or more copies or ultra rapid metabolizers, it may not respond to some of these medications. And this is uh, pretty self-explanatory. We've seen this um, before. Um, Okay, um, I think that's all I want to say about that. Um, other tests um, include um, something called Gene Sight, uh, Gene Sight test. Um, and I've just copied, I'm not going to read it for you, but I've just copied their, you know, marketing material on their website that says, you know, if you're suffering from mental health challenges, challenges, the last thing anyone wants is to go through a lengthy trial and error process with multiple medications. So essentially what they're selling uh, is the ability to predict with gene sight uh, efficacy information that would allow you to uh, predict response to specific medications uh, such as antidepressants um, and, uh, you know, uh, avoid the, the uh, I guess a trial, uh, trials and tribulations, a multiple trial and error uh, approach to um, to prescribing. By the way, as you know, the still the the best predictor, um, uh, you know, before genetic testing of medication response is uh, a family member's uh, response. You know, especially um, first blood, um, uh, or yes. Um, um, yeah, mother, father, uh, genetic sibling uh, responds to a medication. Um, so uh, Medicaid, Medicare cost of gene side is zero. Um, other insurance, it could be up to three, uh, $330 per patient. That was the information on the uh, website. An uninsured uh, question mark, meaning um, it's, it doesn't, the website doesn't tell you whether they have any means of uh, providing um, either a payment plan or discount or, you know, or, or free uh, testing to people who um, are, you know, uh, economically disadvantaged uh, or uninsured. Um, you will find, and this is something that it's important for you to be aware of, especially if you, uh, if you work in a practice where um, uh, individuals use private insurance, uh, that different insurance companies have different rules with regards to the use of genetic testing. Um, and, therefore, and some may cover one test versus another. Some may cover uh, one test, you know, per treatment. Um, episode, whereas others um, only cover one test uh, per lifetime. And so that's important information for you to be aware of before anyone is recommended to have a genetic test. Uh, sure gene, yet another example. Um, let's see, sure gene test for antipsychotic and antidepressant response. The STAR2, STA2R. A breakthrough pharmacogenetic test containing genetic markers for effectiveness of antipsychotic drug treatment. Uh, again, effectiveness of uh, pharmacogenetics um, as opposed to safety pharmacogenetics. Um, and you again, you can uh, see some of the rest of the information from your uh, yourself. I want to highlight where it says clinical studies in Caucasian schizophrenic patients have indicated that SULT4A1-1 um, positive patients treated with olanzapine have greater reduction in psychotic symptoms and significantly lower risk of being hospitalized. Um, and the cost was not uh, shared, was not available on their website. Uh, there's other genetic tests, uh, including mental health DNA insight um, by uh, Pathway Genomics. Uh, cost is, uh, as you can see, it identifies genetic variants that affect the metabolism of efficacy of psychiatric medications. Uh, it tests for more than 50 common antidepressants, mood stabilizers, and antipsychotic medication. Uh, the cost is about $399 per patient. Uh, and here you could see, I'm going to make it bigger, so hopefully you could see more of what a sample report would look like. So if you, if you um, uh, could see 
Um, basically what it shows you, it'll show you the drug class on the left hand side. Uh, it says SSRIs. Uh, the second blue column says uh, which drugs, including citalopram, citalopram, fluoxetine, etc. Uh, preferential use is the dark green color or the third column. Use as directed is the lighter green. May have significant limitations would be the orange uh, uh, or next to the last column and may cause uh, serious adverse effects. So a typical report uh, might show uh, the patient information about which of these medications either would have preferential use, use as directed, uh, may have significant limitations or have significant side effects. Um, and again, this incorporates information about 50 different antidepressants, mood stabilizers, and antipsychotic medications. So uh, this is a pretty uh, lengthy and extensive report. I've just given you a snapshot of what one might look like uh, specifically for SSRIs. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Uscript is another example. Um, what it does is identifies at risk individuals within patient populations and helps medical professionals interpret pharmacogenetic testing results. Uh, Uscript um, is a software tool available to prescribers that predicts potential drug to drug and drug gene and cumulative drug interactions based, based on both cytochrome uh, P450 metabolism and genetic testing. Um, cost is also um, not uh, shared in the uh, in their website. There's other genotyping devices, including uh, Affymetrix, uh, Luminex Tagged, uh, that um, PGX Predict, which is specific to predicting clozapine induce a granulocytosis. So that would be a good example of safety uh, genetic testing or safety pharmacogenetics. Uh, and the physiotype system um, is a test of metabolic test for metabolic syndrome, so or propensity to develop metabolic syndrome. Um, so once again, that would be another good example of safety, um, the use of safety pharmacogenetics. Um, so what this all could mean, you know, this is an example from uh, a text in uh, pharmacogenetic testing in psychiatry uh, that talks about the different combinations um, and potentially the, the, the clinical uh, implications of genetic testing uh, in terms of clinical uh, prescribing or clinical practice. So, you know, for example, in uh, the uh, CYP2D6, uh, Phenothiazine, uh, specifically for phenothiazines, two uh, D6 poor metabolizers should be treated with approximately one half the dose. Uh, haloperidol, they should be treated with lower doses. I think we already knew that. Um, it should be avoided in um, uh, ultra haloperidol specifically. Let me fix that. Should be avoided with six uh, two D6 ultra rapid metabolizers. Uh, for risperidone, poor metabolizers should be treated with approximately one half the dose, and ultra rapid metabolizers may need higher doses, um, but this has not been well studied. It would be the anticipated effect, uh, once again, and I don't know how much more uh, information we have really garnered from genetic testing. If you think back to uh, what we talked about on slide, <laughs> Uh, let me see. This slide, 84. And also this slide, 78. Once again, we kind of already knew that poor metabolizers are going to require much lower doses compared to ultra rapid metabolizers of m several drugs or you know almost any drug in general. Um, same thing here. Um, but this is uh, this information um, is just giving us a little bit more more details as to how much how much uh, lower you know for example half the dose um, etc. Sorry, let me get back to where I was. Okay. 
uh, for antidepressants, uh, genotyping uh, has uh, information that is available. Would say that for TCAs, uh, poor metabolizers in the 2D6 and the 2C19 should be treated with approximately one half the dose. Uh, high doses under therapeutic drug monitoring should be considered for ultra rapid metabolizers. If you remember, therapeutic drug monitoring uh, relates to uh, getting lab levels or laboratory uh, blood levels of the drug um, because, um, as you know, some of these um, drugs uh, can be. Um, can be toxic and even potentially lethal um, at high levels. Um, and ultra rapid metabolizers may need higher doses, um, but it, once again, this has not been studied enough. For venlafaxine, we find that there's insufficient data to provide dose recommendations according to uh, CYP2D6 phenotypes. Uh, peroxetine and flu uh, fluoxetine, there's no clear data on relevance of CYP2D6 phenotypes. And for uh, sertraline, uh, the same could be said about um, uh, the 2C19 uh, phenotype. Um, let me see if there's any. All right. Um, both, on both of the systems, uh, citalopram and escitalopram, uh, you would expect similar reactions based on the fact that they have pretty similar mechanism or same mechanism of action. Uh, poor metabolizers may, may respond better to average doses. So this is somewhat of an unexpected finding um, in that, you know, you would expect lower doses to be um, better. Um, both cytalopram and escitalopram are relatively, have a very, uh, a relatively limited dose range. As you know, uh, for cytalopram, um, a 40, uh, 10 mil, you know, it ranges from 10 to 40 milligrams. A cytalopram, 10 to 20 milligrams is the dose range available. So uh, the average dose for um, both of them is about 20 milligrams. Ultra rapid metabolizers uh, may need higher doses. And again, you know, that's pretty self explanatory um, and the anticipated effect based on everything that we have learned about so far. Uh, subjects intolerant to most antidepressants may be poor metabolizers for uh, the 2D6 and it's, uh, 2C19. Um, and although they say this is rare, less than 1% in all ethnic groups, um, I would say that in clinical practices, uh, practice is not that rare. I think that, um, I mean, I, I couldn't tell you in numbers and I don't see, you know, the, the my caseload is not as heavy um, as that of a full-time provider since my pri uh, primary job is as a, the training director. Um, but it's not, it, it hasn't been rare in my experience to find somebody who has really uh, high difficulty tolerating the side effects of multiple medications, uh, including multi multiple medications in the same class, as well as medications that belong to different classes. Um, so again, I don't know if I agree with the fact that it's um, all that rare, but in terms of um, in terms of the numbers, uh, the poor metabolizing uh, status on both of those enzymes, um, you know, does appear to be a rare event. And in that case, you know, what they recommend is that for a poor metabolizer in the 2D6 and the 2C19, uh, mirtazapine and bupropion uh, may be better choices. And I don't know if I can... And the reason, uh, just in case you're wondering, the reason is because for bupropion specifically, uh, the primary uh, system associated with metabolism is 2B6, uh, 2 Bravo 6 as opposed to 2D6. Um, and for mirtazapine, let's say is, we talked about the 1A2, um, being the primary substrate. It does have some, uh, some enzymatic activity associated with the 2D6 system, but primarily it's 1A2 um, as well as uh, 3A4. 
So that's, uh, those are two medications to definitely keep in mind if you're having somebody, uh, if you have someone who has had a great deal of difficulty tolerating both uh, tricyclics and SSRIs uh, that are primarily uh, metabolized by the 2D6 and the 2C19. Um, we haven't talked yet about uh, phenotyping, and all the uh, examples that I've given you so, so far have to do with genotyping. Uh, phenotyping involves the administration of a probe drug. Um, probe drugs, as I'm, you know, we have mentioned uh, several times already, are drugs that have to be metabolized by the liver in order to convert into the active uh, drug um, for the desired uh, therapeutic effects, whatever they may be, whether they be the analgesic effect of morphine um, through codeine, or uh, for example, some of the pro drugs that we use in psychiatry, um, like uh, Focalin, uh, convert into the active uh, dextroamphetamine um, after uh, being metabolized by the liver. Liver. Excuse me. Uh, some examples of pro drugs include espertine and uh, some of the other ones that you see uh, listed in front of you, like uh, dextromethorphan and uh, mephinetoin. I think that's what I'm reading. Uh, it's uh, the disadvantage is that it, it you know it has slower results than genotyping, um, but the advantage is that it's not as invasive, meaning it doesn't involve uh, a blood sample or a blood, you know, a fluid, uh, fluid sample. Uh, the idea is that based on predicted um, uh, uh, pharmacokinetic properties of each drug, each one of those examples that are listed there, when the drug is administered to an individual um, and levels are, are measured um, at different intervals, we would be able to determine whether the person is a slow metabolizer or a poor metabolizer versus a normal or ultra rapid metabolizer. So not as in, uh, invasive uh, per se, but it's also slower uh, and could be quite complicated. And I, I don't know too many places actually, don't know any places where this is uh, routinely done. So uh, we're going to talk next about the pros and cons in phenotyping and gen, uh, genotyping, and then talk about a few other um, issues that may involved in the pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic um, effects of medications, uh, given uh, the relative um, uh, uh, prevalence of uh, genetic uh, polymorphisms and, and differences. Uh, but before we do that, I think uh, it may be a good time to go ahead and take a break. Uh, we got, um, <coughs> excuse me, sorry. I got uh, five o'clock my time, which means it's two o'clock um, on the West Coast, uh, or actually a couple minutes before. Uh, let's go ahead and come back uh, 10 minutes after the hour. One eighteen, or rather the following slide, uh, one nineteen, where we start talking about the pros and cons. I've already mentioned uh, one of the cons of uh, genotyping um, in the in this day and age. You know, with the current state of knowledge, is that it doesn't it doesn't go far enough into you know predicting either efficacy or safety issues. Um, for um, for most patients at this time, um, and so it's still I think premature uh, to say that this is the way that all patients need to go before we start a pharmacotherapeutic uh, treatment regimen. Um, but in, in addition to that, let's you know let's uh, do consider some pros and cons. Uh, pros uh, it, it might be that it could help us predict. Therapeutic failures or severe adverse drugs re, uh, drug reactions as opposed to the trial and error. Um, and one of the things that you have to think about with therapeutic failures is potentially in our roles as prescribing psychologists rather than just prescribers or uh, is uh, the therapeutic report uh, that could be lost or the therapeutic relationship that could be, um, that could suffer as a result of a drug therapeutic failure. Um, again, you know, we have to take into account how patients see 
us um, in the prescribing role, how patients uh, uh, relate to us, either in a collaborative or a uh, client-centered uh, versus a, a uh, directive or paternalistic uh, type of role. And, uh, and again, there could be some uh, report uh, loss or report cost um, associated with therapeutic failures, especially if we have failed to educate our, our patients appropriately about uh, those potential failures and what they might mean. Uh, one of the things that I think it's really critical for us to do and that it uh, you know, would definitely differentiate us from other prescribers is to take the time uh, to explain the mechanism of action, the onset of uh, therapeutic be benefits sort of, or effects, uh, the potential side effects and how to manage them, not the fact that they could happen, but also how to manage them, um, and uh, what we consider to be the threshold uh, for stopping or changing a therapeutic regimen um, when the adverse effects become intolerable, because at the end of the day, again, we want to be able to maintain the report and we want to be able to, uh, we want to instill hope um, and make sure that our patients know that we believe the medications we are prescribing are going to be safe and effective, uh, but we also want to be able to um, establish um, appropriate and realistic expectations. Um, so enough said about that. Uh, the genotyping or phenotyping can help where the loss of the drug effect may be dangerous. So, for example, you know, drugs like wal uh, warfarin, uh, blood thinner, um, you know, if the medication stop being affected, there could be potential uh, clots or uh, co coagulation issues that would make it uh, dangerous uh, for the patient um, and, and we would want to avoid. Uh, it could help us optimize the drug choice and the dose for effectiveness, which you know could be both uh, practically but also financially uh, beneficial. Um, and that's <clears throat> those are important considerations. So, for example, we can start with a specific drug or lower or higher doses from the start. Uh, those avoiding some of the pitfalls and increasing adherence and, and trust. You know, as I mentioned before. Uh, some other pros, uh, you know, we could potentially avoid serious adverse effects, especially with using drugs that have a narrow therapeutic index, uh, just such as lithium um, or some of the uh, some other uh, uh, medical uh, medications that are used for other uh, medical conditions. Um, as I mentioned, there could be a financial uh, benefit in decreasing medical cost. Um, as you can imagine, every drug trial uh, could be costly uh, for both for the patient and the uh, medical system and that, you know, co-pays uh, for medication, uh, the actual cost or the co-pay for medication uh, could be anywhere from, you know, 10 to 30, $35, depending on, on the insurance plan. Um, and again, this trial and error, we typically would be, you know, prescribing a medication that we could potentially stop later on, um, start another one, um, and have both the cost of unused medications and also, again, the, the, the replacement cost of starting a different trial. Um, Potentially could give us better appreciation for the potential for the risk of polypharmacy. Uh, you know, one of the things that uh, we know as a reality in psychiatry is that polypharmacy is much more the rule uh, than the exception. Um, and we know, of course, that there are very few studies that actually take into account, you know, uh, the uh, metabolism uh, status or the metabolism um, or, or um, other, you know, problems associated with polypharmacy. Uh, which could be better appreciated if we understand that, you know, the interaction of two drugs, uh, which are both metabolized by the same system, could be problematic for someone uh, who has a genetic polymorphism that makes them a poor metabolizer in that drug, um, for that drug or in that system. Uh, the other piece of that that is uh, important is, you know, with regards to polypharmacy, as you know, we mentioned before, is the potential interaction with drugs that either speed up or induce or inhibit uh, the, their own or other drugs metabolism um, and what, you know, what um, the expected effects might be for somebody who, once again, could be a normal but the metabolizer, but under the, the right circumstances become a poor metabolizer 
um, because of that, um, because of that, those in, inhibitory effects. Um, and, you know, as I mentioned before, it could potentially help us to avoid stereotyping patients, as I mentioned um, before, you know, either categorizing patients as either non-compliant or non-adherent uh, or problematic um, because they complain of multiple side effects or, or issues associated with drug use that, you know, may be interpreted by the, uh, by the prescribing provider as, you know, the patient being difficult or treatment resistant or, you know, even character logically uh, problematic uh, versus, you know, an ultra rapid metabolizer being perceived as uh, drug seeking um, or, uh, you know, problematic in a different way because they, they show very little effect um, to the, the standard dose of uh, most medications. Um, again, both of which, um, both of which, um, both problems can help uh, or can impact a therapeutic report and the trust and adherence um, displayed by the patient when they are being perceived um, in a negative fashion. As far as cons, um, it, you know, we want to think, uh, we want to consider that it can provide the, both the therapist and the patient really uh, with. A, a full sense of security um, because as we as I mentioned before the addition of an inhibitor may change the metabolizing status so you know to go back um, make sure I can get back to where I need to be to go back to our genetic testing you know this information uh, would be helpful to us uh, yeah, for example, you know, the use as directed for escitalopram, sertraline, and, and velazodone um, could be quite helpful if those were the only medications that the patient is taking. Uh, but this, you know, test or this report does not take into account uh, what could happen when another drug or substance is introduced uh, that, um, that might change the metabolizing status um, of the patient, as I, you know, as mentioned here on the slide, um, you add an inhibitor and that may change the me metabolizing status, um, or you add an inducer, um, and again, um, that could change the metabolizing status of that same individual. So it could definitely lead to a full uh, sense of security both in the clinicians, both in the clinicians, uh, clinicians part and the, the patients uh, part. Uh, we do not know yet how accurately genotyping predicts metabolic capacity. Um, as you know, last week we talked about, or the last class we talked about, many things, um, interpersonal, um, intrapersonal uh, things that could change the metabolic capacity, including pregnancy and hormonal changes. Um, probe drugs um, do not correlate perfectly with the effects of other drugs, and so you know we could find through phenotyping that a probe drug, uh, that a person who is a poor metabolizer for a probe drug, um, may not necessarily be a poor metabolizer for other drugs. Um, and it doesn't really tell us what to do with drugs that have active metabolites, such as uh, Prozac or fluoxetine. Um, the the another uh, important consideration with regards to con uh, the to phenotyping is that those uh, adverse side effects, anticipated side effects, may not always occur because the body does have compensatory mechanisms, and there are multiple uh, levels. Um, you know, as I mentioned, phase one and phase two uh, metabolism systems and other uh, mechanisms that could potentially account for the. Uh, pharmacokinetic and most importantly the pharmacodynamic effect uh, of a med medication. Um, toxic episodes are not necessarily eliminated by starting with lower doses. Some people are just that sensitive where toxicity could occur at the very lowest dose available. Um, and in fact, uh, just like it could limit, you know, it could give us a full sense of security, it could also lead to unnecessary avoidance of medication that could potentially be useful or augmentation strategies that could potentially be useful uh, just because we don't totally understand, you know, the interrelationship between all these factors and how they may play out in an individual's uh, therapeutic response. 
Um, and last but not least, I don't have it listed on this slide, but I do want to point out that the genotyping uh, tests that are available at this time, as I mentioned before, are differentially uh, reliable and differentially uh, comprehensive. Um, and also, insurance to where, you know, some insurances, very few, I think, um, might cover uh, a test um, that uh, for each episode of care, meaning, for example, if somebody has a major depressive disorder um, uh, recurrent, um, the, the current episode would be considered an episode of care, and potentially a future episode in a couple of years would be considered a different episode of care. Uh, whereas the majority of insurance companies, including Medicaid and Medicare, only cover genetic uh, testing once um, per drug type. So, for example, for the treat for psychotropic uh, medications, uh, it would be a once in a lifetime, which is what was you know most concerning to me about Rebecca's comment that the pediatricians in her practice uh, use it uh, routinely. Um, because um, you've got to imagine, first of all, we don't have, you know, we don't really have uh, a complete uh, set of knowledge with regards to all the uh, genetic uh, factors that could play a part in the efficacy and safety of, um, you know, medications. Plus, you've got to believe that, you know, five years from now, 10 years from now, there will be different medications in the market that could potentially have a better uh, side effect profile and an efficacy profile for that individual, for that child, uh, but they're no longer going to be able to, you know, perform, have uh, genetic testing covered by their insurance because they, they got their once in a lifetime uh, kind of thing. So it's just, uh, too limited, I think, um, and most um, uh, most uh, psychiatrists uh, would agree at this time uh, to again, you know, uh, uh, refer for a widespread um, uh, adoption. And, and again, you know, one of I keep I know I keep bringing this up over and over again. You got to believe that our genetic uh, predisposition doesn't change, but our genetic uh, um, expression does change and so you know could the same individual now or you know 10 years ago versus 10 years and or uh, from now uh, have activated different genes and have a relatively uh, different uh, genetic expression than they have at this moment in time uh, to where you know again those genetic tests that they took you know, a few years back or, or even today uh, might not be useful or predictive um, of anything of significance um, in, when they need another episode of care um, in the future. So, um, enough about that. <laughs> a good point. Um, Janelle shared, I developed nut allergies last year after enjoying a lifetime of eating them. Yes, absolutely. That's exactly what I'm talking about. I have one of my own. One of my sisters developed a shell a shellfish allergy um, as well um, in her mid thirties, um, and that was you know that was another uh, another example of you know having had a lifetime of exposure um, that you know again once again genetic expression uh, can change you know for a multitude of reasons and so uh, again we got to believe uh, that the state of our knowledge. Uh, both from you know the individual genetic uh, uh, genetic uh, genotype as well as from the you know drugs and you know potential side effects of drugs that may be available ten or twenty years from now may be very different. All right, um, so here's an example of how uh, the addition of an inhibitor you know may change uh, for individuals. So you guys know that uh, Paxil is a put, uh, very potent two D six inhibitor. Um, and when you administer uh, Paxil with, um, you know, co so basically the, the, what you're seeing in the picture now, let me um, enlarge it a little bit, is co-administration of codeine uh, and Paxil. Codeine, again, being the um, 
probe drug that turns into morphine. Uh, Paxil creates the inhibition of the 2D6, which is a mechanism by which uh, codeine is metabolized into morphine. And so co-administration will make 2D6 uh, extensive metabolizers or normal uh, metabolizers into very slow or poor metabolizers. Um, so, and, you know, we kind of already touched um, on that before. Um, so again, key important factors uh, for us to consider. Okay, uh, time for a poll question. So uh, let's take a moment and respond to question number seven. All right, I got the majority of you haven't responded um, already. So we're gonna go ahead and close the, the poll. And here we are. Uh, having just gotten off my so a soapbox, the question is the current state of literature provides overwhelming support for the widespread use of genotyping in order to predict drug response and decrease adverse effects. Um, and which is not uh, what I just said. So 85% um, uh, of you are correct. Uh, the answer is false, uh, as in the current state of literature does not provide overwhelming support for widespread use. That doesn't mean that it wouldn't be uh, that there are not individual indications or some support uh, for individual use uh, in certain situations, such as uh, once again, in those, you know, some of the ones that I described before, uh, patients who are have developed adverse effects to several uh, different trials of medications, etc. Uh, but in general, um, we are not there quite yet. Okay, great. Thank you uh, so much for uh, participating. Now we're going to move on to talk about pharmacodynamics. So all this, you know, genotyping, phenotyping, uh, talked in you know, description of pol uh, polymorphisms. Uh, and the SIP450 uh, systems, we're talking about pharmacokinetics. So we're gonna, uh, once again, move on to talk about uh, transcultural psychopharmacology and pharmacodynamics. Um, pharmacodynamics uh, helps us understand the drug's therapeutic window. Um, we are, you know, uh, talk, uh, the, you know, part of the conversation uh, is on drug receptors. Uh, and drug transporters, some uh, examples uh, which are listed there, uh, receptors such as the 5H2A and the 5H2C, which are serotonin, diff uh, different types of serotonin receptors, um, and then the transporters such as uh, serotonin transporter and the norepinephrine transporter, um, as well as molecules involved in signal transduction pathways such as the G proteins. Now, this is not your biochemistry or neurochemistry um, class, so we're not going to delve too, too uh, much into these topics. 
um, but I wanted to make sure to bring them up in the context of what we know uh, are uh, potential genetic differences or ethnic differences in this uh, system. So uh, just to as a reminder, this is a picture from Stoll's book um, that depicts the serotonin transporter, this um, red, red arrow uh, here in the lower right-hand bottom, right-hand side of the picture is uh, a picture, uh, pictorial representation of the serotonin transporter. Um, and um, at the bottom right, this thing that looks like an orange uh, right here, um, is their ser uh, serotonin receptor, which we also talked about before. Now, with regards to the transporter, I want to take you to this area of the, the picture, which is where uh, you see the vari variants, um, the variant forms of um, alleles with the S. Um, let me see if I can, I want to kind of draw your attention. Uh, to the specific area of the right. Here. Oh, sorry, that was not good. Um, the short allele, not great, but here's a short allele is the one that is bluish purple, uh, a long uh, uh, form of the same allele. Uh, the 5-HTT LPR is represented by the red uh, one at the bottom uh, right there. Um, by the way, uh, again, as I'm giving you tidbits, you know, that could hopefully help your studying uh, for the um, for the PEP as well as your future practice as either prescribers or consultants, um, I want to definitely draw your attention to Stahl's uh, psychopharmacology textbooks. Um, and if you haven't, um, consider subscribing to his website. I think um, it's called the Neuroscience Education Institute. Uh, they provide frequent updates with regards to you know medi new medications and new areas of information regard to, uh, regarding psychotropic medications. They have C courses and other uh, benefits that you might find uh, useful. Uh, again, this is Stoll's um, Neuroscience Education Institute. And again, no uh, financial uh, disclosures to make in that regard. Okay, so the CERT or the serotonin transporter, that um, red you know arrow that I showed you in the previous picture, um, has been studied and uh, psychopharmac uh, in antidepressant response. And I, the reason I wanted to highlight the short allele versus the, the long allele of the functional uh, promoter um, is because this polymorphism, so the polymorphism would be the genetic variation between, yes, that's correct, um, S-T-A-H-L. Um, the, uh, uh, it, it's, uh, again, genetic polymorphism or genetic variation in this allele, the 5-HTT LPR, has been associated with reduced or delayed uh, therapeutic benefits and increased adverse effects with SSRI treatment in some Caucasian samples. So uh, keep that in mind um, because you'll see something entirely different in the next slide. So Caucasian samples, short allele, uh, associated with reduced or delayed therapeutic effect to SSRIs. Uh, in contrast, uh, in the long allele, uh, some other studies that showed the insertion or deletion uh, polymorphism in the long allele versus the short allele uh, found that um, patients or individuals who are homozygotic, mean they have two um, uh, similar um, long alleles showed less fear and anxiety related behaviors um, and the relative prevalence uh, or the uh, uh, relative prevalences for though for the homozygotic L allele uh, presentation is about 77 uh, to 87 percent in African Americans uh, 70 percent among populations of sub-saharan origin 56 to 60 percent in Caucasians um, and 30 percent among East Asians. Um, that same uh, promoter uh, region, allele, long allele, is associated with better or more rapid 
um, SSRI response in five studies of U in Europe and North America. Uh, and in two or three studies in Asia, the S allele was predictive of better SSRI response. So again, keep in mind, this previous slide showed that in Caucasian samples, a short allele was associated with delayed or reduced response. Um, in this study in Asia, the S allele was associated with better SSRI response. So, and it may be that, you know, again, this is an ethnic uh, specific um, um, finding. Um, okay, I just want you to kind of think about that. Um, of clinical significance, this was another finding, a combination of six polymorphisms located in the serotonin 2A receptor, the 2C receptor, and the serotonin transporter uh, genes predicted clozapine response to a level of 76.7%, uh, which is not an, an insignificant number. It's a pretty uh, pretty good number indeed when you consider the pharma pharmacotherapeutic uh, response rates to most psychotropic medications. Um, so, um, so it is possible that, you know, there is some, uh, that there's enough, uh, you know, that sometime in the, in the future we will have uh, more clear um, information um, and, a, and a way to test, uh, not just for, uh, for example, for issues associated with the CYP450, uh, but issues associated with the uh, transporter genes, um, and, you know, perhaps even genetic polymorphisms associated with the UGT1 uh, and 2 and other uh, systems uh, that uh, help with uh, phase 2 metabolism um, that would help us predict both a pharmacokinetic and a pharmacodynamic uh, effect of medications, both from a safety uh, and efficacy pers perspective. Um, and here's another example. Um, uh, the catechol-methyltransferase, or COMPT, uh, which you have learned about in other classes, I'm sure, uh, is among the proteins involved in the synthesis and the catabolism of the catecholamines. Uh, um, finding from, uh, with regards to the COMPT, is that polymorphisms um, in this uh, uh, system are associated with vulnerability to diseases, including schizophrenia, um, and uh, you could re see a reduction of its activity by a single mutation, uh, which is present in 26% of African Americans, 18% of Asians, and 50% of Caucasians. Um, I do want to say that um, at least until very recently, and you want to, you've seen, you've probably seen a lot of uh, news or heard a lot of news about the use of pharmacogenetics in, in medicine, especially in the field of cancer um, or oncology. Uh, genotyping um, is, has been until very recently most commonly used in the fields of psychiatry, neurology, um, oncology, and cardiovascular medicine. And I don't, I don't know that I would say that each one of those specialties has equally advanced um, its knowledge or, um, again, its efficacy and safety uh, based on genotyping. I think that, you know, from what I hear, and I'm not I'm definitely not an expert in any of the other fields, um, uh, that, you know, you hear many more advances uh, being made with uh, genetic therapy or gene therapy for oncology specifically and potentially for cardiovascular medicine um, as opposed to some a somewhat uh, less um, uh, rate of, uh, um, of um, um, success uh, or rate of uh, progress um, associated with psychiatry and neurology. And, you know, bear in mind that when we talk about neurology, we're primarily talking um, at least, you know, specific to genotyping uh, about treatment uh, of neurocognitive uh, diseases such as Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and, and other type of uh, dementing uh, type of illnesses. Uh, so once again, I, I'm not, I don't want to 
uh, de-emphasize the importance of individualized treatment and, you know, and, and treating and creating uh, or tailoring medica medicine or medications uh, to, to individuals and how important that might be um, in the future of psychiatry um, and in the future of many other, you know, medical um, knowledge and information. Um, but like I said, um, you know, I think the consensus is that we're just not there um, just yet. Okay, um, we, I have a clinical detective exercise next. Um, I realize I'm a bit ahead of schedule and I know uh, that we're, you know, uh, based on my outline, we're not supposed to move into uh, culture specific factors just yet. But I think uh, what I wanna do is I'm going to um, push uh, through uh, the next um, several slides um, in um, to start addressing some of those culture specific factors today. Uh, we're not uh, going to have a end of the hour break uh, this hour, but what I'm likely, uh, what I think I'm gonna do is I'm going to assign uh, the clinical detective uh, case and uh, a reading assignment uh, for tonight. Um, and then we're gonna break uh, probably uh, in class uh, um, about 20 to 30 minutes early uh, today, just so you have an opportunity uh, to review uh, those, those materials. I hope no one is disappointed um, or upset by that. Um, like I said, I wanna give you, I wanna give you some opportunity to process this materials. So, Along those lines, uh, I'm going to skip now to uh, slide 134, um, or 135 rather, um, and then uh, uh, we'll begin as, uh, our discussion about the major ethnic groups in the U.S. and some uh, some uh, with some qualifications about um, expectations that you uh, you know for things that you might expect to see uh, among these groups as it relates to uh, mental illness and, and pharmacotherapy. Um, so what we're going to talk about hopefully in this section are culture specific factors that affect drug response and pa including patient adherence. Um, uh, beliefs and expectations about their illness and about treatment, whether uh, they're negative, such as non-adherence or poor therapeutic response or uh, adverse effects, um, and uh, placebo uh, positive, such as placebo effect, uh, the clinician ideology, uh, clinician patient past experience, and use of traditional treatment. So I'm going to try to hit most of most if not all of these topics as they relate to the major ethnic groups. And I see we have some questions in the chat. Uh, is the clinical detective homework for tonight? Yes. Uh, and then we and we also have some questions for tonight. And yes, that's true. The questions are really a good way to consolidate the knowledge uh, that you have or the information that you have received so far. Uh, so we do have some questions for tonight. Uh, and we will do the clinical detective and um, one more reading, which is not a hard reading. So I don't, I don't think you'll, you'll have difficulty with that. Okay. Um, all right. So we're going to talk about uh, major ethnic groups in the U.S. And you saw in my outline today, uh, the ones that I uh, chose to address, uh, mainly because their numbers, uh, relative, you know, prevalence in the U.S. population, um, and because we have the largest amount of knowledge, you know, accumulated uh, for these groups. Uh, and, and of course, also because they, uh, they represent, you know, uh, client populations that you might see in, in your practices. I do want to start off um, by making a disclaimer that um, it, it is um, it is hardly um, possible, I think, uh, to uh, talk about these subjects uh, without making generalizations uh, and without uh, resorting to some uh, group uh, specific information that may not be as relevant to individuals. Uh, that um, belong to the same identity or, you know, are parts, um, uh, are considered to be part of those groups. Um, and that I want to, as much as I want to emphasize um, uh, intra-group intra versus intra-group intra differences, 
um, some, uh, there's going to be some overgeneralization. So I do want you to uh, think about considering levels of acculturation, immigration routes, uh, status, you know, for example, a refugee versus an intellectual uh, migrant um, or an economic uh, migrant, uh, a model, you know, the concept of being a model minority, uh, the socioeconomic uh, variables associated with uh, immigration and or minority status, both um, are uh, appropriate to consider. Um, and as well as education attainment, education levels, uh, language proficiency, and so many other factors. So again, uh, just want to emphasize that uh, there will be generalizations and there will be likely, you know, ways that I can offend someone or everyone um, in making those some of these generalizations, but I think it's important information to share. And again, I want you to keep in mind that you're the, the individual, once again, that is sitting, sitting across uh, your office from you um, may have had a completely different experience from what you would assume a person of their group uh, may have. Um, okay. All right, so uh, with regards to epidemiological factors, we talked about this before, right? You've seen this chart in the previous class. Um, I talked about the main causes of death in females in the US. Uh, the top three, or the, really the most common being heart disease and cancer, and the uh, close uh, third, fourth, and fifth, uh, chronic lower respiratory diseases, stroke, and Alzheimer's disease. And you can look, take a look at the other ones. Uh, for yourself. But what is interesting is that um, those factors are different for different ethnic groups. Um, so those causes of death uh, do vary by ethnic groups. So I want, so these are uh, females and we're going to do uh, men uh, or talk about men separately um, as they relate to epidemiolo epidemiological factors. Uh, so, for example, American Indian and Alaska Natives, as well as Asian Pacific and Latino women, have a higher incident of cancer than of heart disease. So, if you looked at this slide again, the numbers would be reversed. Not exactly, but cancer would be the top uh, killer uh, when we talk about those groups. Uh, American Indians' risk of unintentional injuries is twice as high as every other group. Uh, unintentional injuries relate to accidental deaths um, from many factors, uh, including motor vehicle accidents and other type of accidents. American Indian and Alaska Natives have the lowest risk of heart disease of all groups, uh, with their prevalence being 17% as opposed to uh, 20 plus percent, 21 I think is um, all groups combined, almost 22 actually. Um, Latino women only. Um, uh, sorry, I didn't mean to say only because they are one of uh, two groups. Uh, one of the two groups with chronic liver disease in the top 10. As you could see, chronic liver disease is not in the top 10 for, for the entire female population, um, but it is for Latino women and uh, American Indian and Alaska Natives uh, with prevalence rates of 5.4% versus 2-3% uh, for the general population. Uh, bl black and Asian women only have hypertension, hypertension listed as one of the top 10 uh, with 2% uh, prevalence rate. And Black, Latino, Asian, um, American Indian women um, have a risk of diabetes that is twice to three times um, as high as every other group. I think I meant to have the Alaska Native qualification right there. Sorry about that. Okay, so again, for Black, Latino, Asian, American Indian, and Alaska Native women, uh, the risk of diabetes is twice as two, three times as high as um, every other group, including uh, whites and um, all races or all ethnicities combined. Um, so those are important things to know in terms of, um, you know, relative disease um, and, and uh, um, 
risk of fatality factors, um, especially as you consider uh, medication use. So, you know, if you know, for example, that hypertension uh, is a specifically significant risk factor, so Black and Asian women, uh, your consideration of, uh, uh, you know, psychotropic medications that could influence hypertension, uh, such as, you know, velmopaxine um, or some of the other SNRIs and or the, the antipsychotics that could complicate uh, or increase the risk of metabolic syndrome uh, would be important considerations. Uh, likewise, uh, risk of diabetes, you know, in this um, uh, minority populations listed in the in the last bullet, uh, once again, you'd want to consider how they may be, uh, how metabolic syndrome uh, could be influenced uh, with the choice of medications that you might be considering. Uh, for males, uh, again, we see some uh, similar causes of death in the first um, two, uh, heart disease, which heart disease being much more uh, common than in females, cancer, um, similar rates. Um, but um, again, as we learned in the previous class, unintentional injuries, uh, suicide, and chronic liver disease um, are unique, um, to, not unique to men per se, but are, are much uh, much more of a risk factor in men uh, than they are in, in women. Yeah, there's almost twice as, uh, twice as high a rate of unintentional injuries. And uh, like I said before, suicide and chronic liver uh, disease are not in the top 10 uh, for women. Uh, once again, we'll review some uh, epidemiological uh, factors that are ethnic uh, specific, including uh, the, um, the idea uh, or the fact that for black males, homicide ranks in the top 10 as number five, and septicemia as number nine, not something that you see uh, for the rest of the group uh, combined. So the fact that homicide uh, ranks as a uh, top 10 uh, top five, really, um, uh, risk of death or um, cause of death uh, in black males is a socio um, is a sociological um, um, factor or or fact uh, that we really need to be thoughtful about. Uh, homicide is also in the top ten for American Indians and Latinos, but not Asian Americans. Uh, rate, rates of death uh, due to heart disease or cancer uh, are pretty comparable among all the races um, or ethnicities, except for American Indian, Alaska Natives, uh, for whom they are significantly uh, lower. Um, and um, unintentional injuries are much higher among Hispanics or Latinos. Um, all groups except American Indians and Blacks have suicide in the top 10. So with regards to uh, suicide risk factors, um, being white, uh, Latino, um, Asian, and, um, uh, and Alaska Natives uh, carries a lesser risk than being American Indian or, um, yes, American Indian or, I'm sorry, have a higher risk um, uh, versus American Indians and, and African Americans. Okay. Um, so as far as Asian Americans, uh, they, uh, you know, they immigrated uh, to the U.S. from over 20 countries. Uh, they speak more than 100 different languages, uh, including uh, uh, more than a hundred different languages, not included, because they're not listed there. Uh, the most common uh, countries of origin include China, India, Japan, Philippines, Korea, uh, uh, Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam, Thailand, and Pakistan. And by relative numbers, uh, I don't know if you knew this, I didn't until uh, just recently, but the highest, the second highest uh, immigrant uh, group in the United States, as far as country of origin, are Indian Americans, uh, with the first one being Mexican Americans. Um, 
some uh, some issue uh, I want I do want to emphasize that routes of immigration and 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 reasons for immigration um, are going to be very different um, among these groups. You know, think about um, the the fact that Asian Americans uh, could have migrated um, in in uh, the early uh, years of our American story, American history. Um, uh, for example, Chinese uh, Americans could have, you know, several centuries uh, of generations here in the United States. Uh, we saw more recent immigration from uh, Laos, uh, Cambodia, Vietnam, and Thailand as a result of the Vietnam War, um, pre, uh, pre, during, and post. Uh, especially post uh, Vietnam War, there was a, a significant amount of refugee uh, immigration uh, from these uh, places, um, and uh, and again different different histories of uh, migration, either through economic means or refugee, uh, political and and uh, socio as yeah socioeconomic uh, refugee um, in this. Um, in this population. Uh, let's see, what else do I want to say about this? Um, some interesting facts, uh, again, nothing you, uh, or it's nothing you have to memorize because it's not in the slide. So uh, just, you know, additional knowledge for you. Um, prior to 1965, there were about 1 million Asian Americans in the US. Um, forward uh, to, to 2000 and there were almost 12 million um, Asian Americans in the United States. Um, most uh, in, in what happened in 1965, in case you're wondering, is that the Supreme Court struck down uh, immigration quotas based on national origin. So the ability for different uh, people of different countries to migrate uh, was no longer limited. Uh, largest populations in descending order of P uh, people from a Asian background are Chinese, Filipino, uh, Asian, Indian, Vietnamese, Korean, Japanese, and Southeast Asian um, ancestry. Um, or they were um, in, in 2000, I should say. As I mentioned before, uh, more recently, um, Indian Americans have surpassed um, the number of Chinese Americans. Although that doesn't seem um, accurate, but I'll double check on that. Um, for Asian Pacific women, excuse me, it's important to know that they have a higher incident of a higher incidence of cancer uh, than uh, you would see of heart disease. Um, common sites of cancer among Chinese women specifically, and these are just, I, I've thrown together a number of facts because there's not a lot of, you know, congruent uh, sources of data um, that can give you uh, information about this group. So, you know, that it may seem like odds and ends, and, and that may be because that's what they are. Um, uh, among Chinese women, tom, uh, common sites of cancer include the lungs, breast, colon, stomach, and pancreas. Uh, and invasive cancer rates are much higher among Southeast Asian women uh, compared to, um, uh, you know, compared to other women. Uh, common sites of cancer among Chinese men include liver, colon, stomach, and nasopharynx. Um, Let's see, for Vietnamese American women, uh, cervical cancer incidence and mortality far exceed those of other minority or majority populations. And, um, you know, factors associated with that may include um, prevention or preventative uh, screenings uh, in practice, as well as potentially access to care or disparate uh, different sources of care, um, hard, to, hard to know. Um, and, and of course, it's important to consider that newcomers, depending on the point of origin, may have been exposed to uh, several diseases, including hepatitis, uh, parasites, malaria, and or uh, Hansen's uh, disease, um, as well as, you know, potentially, um, you know, given the current crisis, um, different types of flu uh, and other viral uh, infections. Um, 
Uh, let's see, common diseases in certain areas include uh, tuberculosis or TB, hepatitis B, uh, intestinal parasites, like I mentioned before, including hookworm, uh, giardia, and estrongyloids. Um, lactose intolerance is uh, quite common among Asians. You'll find that it's also common among, among other minority groups, including Native Americans and the African Americans. Um, and uh, therefore, you might see dietary habits that are consistent with this uh, propensity. Um, some Asians may develop a severe form of what is called G6PD or glucose 6-phosphate uh, dehydrogenase uh, deficiency. Um, if you're not familiar with G6PD deficiency, um, it can have significant uh, negative effects uh, associated. It's, it's a, can cause severe anemia. Uh, excuse me. And uh, that could potentially become lethal um, under certain conditions, in, uh, conditions including a significant amount of uh, stress, um, acute or otherwise. So, uh, for example, dehydration um, or heat, uh, heat uh, stroke, uh, heat, um, yeah, heat stroke. Um, Indian American males are at high risk for coronary heart disease, uh, and women have a higher risk for osteo. Uh, porosis uh, compared to the general population. Uh, and Pakistani women especially are at high risk for coronary heart disease. Um, okay, I want to highlight that, um, let's see, sorry, this is kind of in the way. Uh, there's a lot of cultural influences. If you remember, we talked about culture being a set of beliefs, shared beliefs, um, identities, and behaviors uh, that um, make you know make uh, or uh, are relevant to a group. Um, what we can, you know, it's hard to make generalizations about Asians um, as different as you know, for example, Indian or Pakistani uh, versus Indonesian or Pacific Islanders. Um, or Japanese, Chinese, et cetera. Uh, one of the things that we uh, do know is that um, uh, beliefs, including uh, uh, philosophies such as like Buddhist uh, beliefs, uh, impact many current health uh, care beliefs and, and practices, even for people who are not considered to be uh, religiously uh, Buddhist. Um, so those beliefs include things like an integration of the mind and body, uh, which is each influenced by, by the other, um, you know, the idea of yin and yang and indoor, you know, the balance between uh, different um, elements in, in the environment um, being important factors that contribute to either health or illness. Um, and um, as mentioned in the slide there, illness can be viewed as a loss of balance between the individual um, and their environment. Um, in general, um, Bud Buddhist uh, philosophy encourages respect for elders and those in authority, such as healthcare provider, uh, which may lead to a uh, perception of healthcare providers as, uh, uh, or, or the desire for healthcare providers to be uh, more directive and paternalistic as opposed to collaborative or uh, client-centered, um, just because, again, those uh, beliefs in, in authority. Um, it also, uh, that philosophy teaches that life is a cycle of suffering and rebirth, uh, hence pain is, and illness are sometimes endured, and health-seeking remedies uh, may be delayed. And so, you know, if you believe that pain and suffering uh, are part of the natural cycle of life, then it's very possible uh, that healthcare for a condition that, uh, that m does manifest with pain um, may be delayed, uh, as mentioned there, or that, you know, the individual may adopt a, an acceptance uh, of their pain uh, without necessarily questioning where that pain may be coming from or how to get rid of it. And, and as you can imagine, this, this is a significant contrast uh, from a mainstream, um, for lack of a better way of saying it, uh, from the mainstream American perspective, 
um, especially that we've seen in recent years where, you know, pain is to be treated um, and uh, removed as quickly as possible and it's undesirable and, uh, and problematic, uh, therefore leading to, you know, significant problems with overuse and misuse of pain, uh, pain control or painkillers um, and a sort of an ever um, or self perpetuating uh, problems associated with pain, pain and pain management. Um, healing is seen as both uh, spiritual as well as scientific. Um, and so uh, there's every reason to believe that there could be a combination of treatments uh, that are sought out by an individual uh, who might be seeking your services, but also seeking the services of a uh, natural healer um, or um, religious uh, healer or uh, or you know uh, practitioner of um, you know other forms of natural uh, and and or other uh, natural remedies. Uh, likewise, um, their um, beliefs in um, Ayurvedic medicine, which is you know common in uh, some uh, some areas in South Asia, uh, including India um, and um, and other uh, nearby places. Um, uh, it's based on, uh, you know, uh, uh, based on ancient writings that rely on natural and holistic approach to physical and mental health. Uh, again, you know, re uh, reliance on uh, the, the natural and the uh, a spiritual as well, uh, to some extent, as a scientific is knowledge that has been passed out, passed down uh, from, you know, generation to generation. Um, it's one of the uh, oldest medical systems and remains one of India's uh, traditional healthcare systems. And if you live um, in an area uh, here in the United States where there's a high, uh, there's a high percentage or high numbers of uh, Indian American populations, you'll see Ayurvedic uh, clinics, um, um, you know, uh, here and there. Um, um, uh, pretty easily available uh, uh, for the to serve the population's needs. Um, it uh, typically combines products uh, which are mainly derived from plants, but may also include animal, uh, metal, or mineral, uh, as well as diet, exercise, and lifestyle. And it could include things like meditation, uh, and if you you know the, those that's what I mean by uh, lifestyle. Um, uh, meditation and yoga and, and that sort of thing. Uh, there's approximately 1,400 plants used in the Ayurvedic medicine. Uh, herbs are metabolized gradually with very few side effects. Uh, the disease state is, uh, is viewed as a state of imbalance, just like it, it is in uh, Buddhist uh, philosophy. And once again, in this you know, traditional practice, uh, there is uh, there are beliefs associated with respect for elders um, and authority, um, and so you know, once again passed down from generation to met, uh, generation, um, and a lot of uh, with a lot of influences. And one of the things that um, that uh, it's important to highlight again is that those um, most of the therapeutic. Um, Products associated with this type of medicine are relatively uh, are metabolized um, uh, easily and gradually with very few side effects. And so, uh, individuals who, uh, in contrast to Western medicine, where you know medications or uh, pharmaceuticals can be quite powerful and can cause pretty distressing side effects. Um, individuals who ascribe to this uh, system of, um, of care uh, may have difficulty um, uh, processing this. Okay, uh, we're going to do our first case example right now. Uh, so I want to, uh, I want to take a moment to give you a descriptor. Uh, some descriptor. Um, doctor, sorry to interrupt. Is it okay that I run a poll as well? The sure. Attendance? Perfect. Thank you. Let's do that.
I'll give it a few more seconds before closing the poll. Okay, <clears throat> thank you for uh, polling uh, the attendance. Okay, um, I'll clarify what, um, what is uh, needed for tonight. And uh, just so you have some peace of mind, I am gonna, uh, I am gonna release you today um, in you know, roughly 18 to 20 minutes. So you'll have an extra half hour. Uh, the clinical detective is one thing. Uh, the clinical detective is just a uh, clinical case example, which you know requires just reading and and trying to come up with you know one or two ideas as to why uh, the the specific effect may have been uh, may have been related. Uh, there's a, an article uh, from the New York Times again, maybe one one or two pages at most, and you, some of you may be familiar with it already. Uh, that I want you to read. And then we have the intermediate questions. Um, so th there are a few things, um, but like I said, I am gonna give you some time, um, which is really within class time uh, to be able to do at least the first two. Um, and hopefully the questions will be uh, quite, quite easy based on the information that we have uh, shared today. So don't despair, um, it's gonna be, it's, um, it's gonna be okay. All right. <clears throat> okay, so let's talk about the case example. Uh, I want to talk about uh, this individual. So, um, so just to uh, make sure uh, that I'm clear, this is not uh, a case uh, where the individual uh, treated was an Asian American, um, but where the spouse of the patient is an Asian American. And I want to one one to get you to think about some of the cultural. Um, beliefs and cultural speci culture specific uh, factors that may have played a role um, in their presentation. So my patient uh, was a 42 year old, um, high ranking, I would say high uh, ranking in the enlisted rank um, individual uh, who presented for treatment after being, um, after experiencing an episode of depression uh, with anxiety, with anxious distress, um, and uh, in the onset of the, the depression uh, was associated with reuniting with his family after he had spent a year um, at a remote tour, a remote tour for uh, the Air Forces either uh, in Turkey or Korea, um, although there are sometimes uh, tours in uh, places like Qatar or Kuwait. Uh, where members are separated for their families for about a year. Um, and they, have, they do have the opportunity to uh, visit the family at least uh, one time during that year. So the member had just finished, had just returned home, was reintegrated, uh, reintegrating with his family after having spent a year uh, separated from uh, his wife and child. So wife is um, um, Asian American. She is of um, uh, Korean uh, descent. Uh, born and raised in Korea. They met in Korea uh, several years back, uh, married, and he, um, she immigrated with him back to the States upon his uh, return. Uh, they have a 14-year-old year old, uh, son. Um, they, um, they are Christian um, by background um, and have been married for, um, I want to say about 16 years, about two years before the birth of their, their first son. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, the, the client presented with symptoms of depression, with anxious distress. Um, he uh, was had initially been prescribed uh, Paxil um, by his uh, primary care physician before he uh, started uh, treatment or before he started seeing me um, and had just started uh, his uh, uh, treatment or his therapeutic um, regimen with Paxil, uh, let's say 20 milligrams at the time. Uh, there were no other medical comorbidities uh, and no other significant uh, mental health or no history of significant mental health problems. 
um, or other concerns. So after about two, ye two weeks of uh, treatment with Paxil, um, the individual developed uh, suicidal ideation. And in the context of an argument with his wife, um, essentially took, you know, dumped uh, his bottle of medication into his hand and uh, was, um, um, you know, was uh, moving his hand in the direction of taking, you know, swallowing or putting all the pills in his mouth. Um, at the same time when his wife, you know, basically swatted um, his hand away um, and interrupted uh, his attempt. Uh, the uh, member or the, uh, the patient was hospitalized um, as a result of that um, as a, a suicide attempt, if you, if you want to describe it as such. Um, and um, switch to um, another antidepressant, I can't recall which one it was at that time, and started on clonopin. And the, the reason for the clonopin was to decrease some of the agitation and anxiety uh, that had been uh, manifested and thought to be uh, related to the, uh, to the suicide attempt. Um, and uh, it was uh, essentially, um, thought of um, as uh, being short term. So <clears throat> this is my first visit, sorry, uh, with the patient and his wife after the, uh, his release from the hospital. Uh, and she comes in and uh, essentially is, is uh, concerned about his response to the clonopin, uh, her uh, 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 her uh, words uh, were something along the line of, uh, I don't like it, he seems drunk, um, it's just, is not effective, um, I, don't, I don't think he needs it, uh, please, you know, stop this medication. His response is, I'm doing just fine, I feel calm, um, I, you know, I'm, I know I'm getting better, I'm no longer suicidal, please keep me on this medication. Um, so with that, I mean, I know it's a lot of information um, and some, you know, is specific and some is very nonspecific, um, but I wonder about your thoughts about what, um, what do we need to do, what do we need to uh, think about in terms of managing the care of this patient uh, from a culturally uh, competent uh, perspective as it relates to, uh, to his wife and his family. How long were they married? Uh, 16 years at that time. Their son is 14 years old and is a freshman in high school. Uh, provide psychoeducation on risk and benefits of medications. As says Heather, uh, we can ask for consent to discuss treatment concerns with her. Absolutely, and we did. Um, we had his consent. Uh, we definitely wanted to make sure that um, he was okay with uh, bringing her into the, the loop. Any other questions that you might have or interventions that you might want to think about uh, for this individual and in his his family or his wife specifically again remember the her concern is he seems drunk this medication is not helpful what can i you know what can you do to stop it and his report is everything is going well let's keep things the way they are how long since he returned? Just a couple months. He was just a few months um, home, essentially. Uh, you said she's Korean national, and what was his nationality? Good question. I don't think I said that. He is, um, he's uh, Caucasian, uh, European American. I think he was born uh, and raised in the South. I don't remember exactly where. Uh, neither a rural, uh, not a 
uh, but uh, somewhere in the South. How much of the suicide attempt was due to reunification stress and relearning how to be in the same location as her? Uh, that's a really good question. I, I mentioned before I cued you into the fact that this was an attempt that happened during the um, uh, during an intense argument uh, with his wife. Um, so we can make a case, I think, based on the fact that he had just started um, medications and had never had any suicidal thoughts or wishes um, before uh, this time, uh, that it could be an SSRI-induced um, suicidal, um, suicidal act. Um, but it is possible that part of it was, you know, based on the stress and, and the, the stress of the uh, reunification. Um, Carmen says, so he has not been reintegrated. I would want to learn what are her impressions of his symptoms. Very good point. I think, you know, this is one area where we definitely could make, uh, could make some interventions is in helping her to uh, express, to be able to express her views, her conceptualization of his problems, of his issues, her understanding of his emotional state uh, and the causal factors associated with that, um, as well as his symptoms and how they should be managed based on her belief system and her cultural background. Uh, that was an important part of what we were able to do. Um, and, and being able to do that um, with her and with him in the same room, uh, we were able to uh, communicate, providing psychoeducation from a scientific perspective, um, but also helping uh, the couple to communicate with each other about realistic expectations about treatment um, and what it should or shouldn't be. Um, Angela says, ask more about what she means. Uh, he asks, he acts strong, get more detail on her complaint. Yeah, that's a very good point. What does it mean when uh, she says that he acts strong? I think she was talking about the fact that he seems overly sedated and that she was uncomfortable with uh, the pace, the slowing down, the sedative uh, effects of the clonopin, uh, where he just saw it as a calming uh, effect that, that was potentially beneficial um, based on, on his anxiety and psychological distress or anxious distress that he had experienced up until that point. So uh, in his view, it was calming him down to where he was actually able to, uh, to function. In her view, he was slowed down and, um, and it, was, it was uncomfortable and, and perhaps inappropriate. Um, why that why does she feel she it's not working that's exactly the reason because it because he does appear drunk and out of it and you know she he's just she's not just not used to him um being um uh, being in that state um brady says marital therapy also i'd be interested in knowing her perspective of what would be helpful uh, very good uh, very good points that's uh that's one uh, referral that we were able to make and was appropriate, um, especially because as it turns out, uh, part of the reason that he presented, come to find out later on, part of the reason that he presented with depression and anxious distress upon uh, reunification with his family is that he had had or had been engaging in an emotional affair uh, with another woman while he was separated from his wife, um, geographically separated from his wife. So absolutely important uh, to know uh, that uh, piece of information and to integrate that um, in, you know, in um, his treatment and of course in the recommendation for couples therapy. Uh, Eddie says, I don't think I would do much more than offer education and discussion with his wife for consent. If he's reporting benefit from intervention and no desire to change, then I don't see more to do. That's a very good point. And I think, you know, uh, again, from a conservative approach, I would agree that uh, use of the benzodiazepine uh, was appropriate because if, if the suicide attempt was driven by akathisia, uh, that was SSRI induced. Uh, I think providing that psychoeducation and so long as he is comfortable with the treatment, allowing the treatment to continue as planned uh, seemed appropriate and it was appropriate. Um, but, you know, through that communication uh, with both of them at the same time, we were able to help her understand A, that it was supposed to be short term and also 
come to an agreement as to how it's going to be tapered uh, to uh, to some of decre to decrease some of her discomfort, but also to make sure that he was not um, he did not become dependent on that medication. Um, Eddie Taylor says, uh, she appears to be concerned with the side effects of the treatment. There may be other factors regarding his tour of duty. Has he engaged in combat? He could also benefit from therapy, uh, non-med with the psychopharm. Yes, good points. He did not engage in combat. This was a non-combat uh, uh, tour. Um, but as I mentioned before, the affair was something that needed to be addressed for him um, individually and also uh, as it related to his identity, his feelings about his wife and family, uh, his, the guilt associated with the uh, affair, as well as um, uh, the, the, he, he had every intention to end the affair um, and continue life with his uh, son and, and wife. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, he says not likely. He's Air Force. Um, I'm not sure what you mean by that. With regards to combat, um, we do have a plenty, plenty of individuals who have uh, combat experience um, in the Air Force. Um, they will get over it while eating steak in the chow hall. Okay, I'm not sure where to go with that. Um, okay. Um, Oh, I see your point. Got it. <laughs> um, yeah, again, this was a non-combat tour, but that doesn't mean that is the, the norm. Um, okay, so I think that's uh, likely the end of the comments uh, for this case. Again, important factors to uh, take into account are the, uh, the, the diversity, the cultural diversity uh, associated, not, not in this case with the patient, but with his wife. Um, and of course, the contributing factors uh, that, uh, that played a part into, um, into um, uh, the, the patient's presentation that uh, if we had ignored, uh, could potentially end it up in a, in a worse outcome for the patient. Because I can only imagine that if the patient uh, went home, you know, continue, if we hadn't brought her in, if she, you know, if we hadn't heard her side and helped you know, it helped both of them to communicate better about his treatment. Uh, she might have become an impediment to uh, his continued adherence to the treatment service, or uh, she might have um, uh, become hostile or or uh, rejecting or, you know, in some ways uh, non-supportive, uh, which could have uh, definitely affected his uh, treatment adherence. Um, okay. Thank you all for your input. I wanted to make sure to bring some clinical examples, just like we did for the previous class. Um, and I appreciate you participating. Um, OK, here's a thought. Um, like I said, we are ahead of schedule. Uh, so maybe we'll put off the clinical detective for the beginning of tomorrow's class. We have enough, more than enough time tomorrow uh, to be able to capture that. Um, uh, I am going to, so the main two, sorry, let me find what I need. Uh, so two uh, intermeeting or intermeeting assignments are the questions that, uh, that you guys, uh, that have already been posted, posted into Moodle. Um, and then uh, this is the article from the New York Times that I thought I would, um, share with you. Want you to read. It's an easy read. It shouldn't be any um, any any more than you know maybe 15, 20 minutes. Uh, again, which I'm I'm giving you at the end of this class, uh, and I'll be interested in hearing your comments later. So uh, I just posted the link to the chat. I want to check in with you um, if so if you guys could verify whether the link is um, active. Excellent. Good to hear. Okay, so with that, we are, like I said, we are ahead. I don't think you need to subscribe. Let me, I wanna test it. Let's see.
Yep. Yeah. Yes, doctor, it doesn't need a subscription. I also have access to the whole article. Okay, excellent. All right. Okay, um, so like I said, we are a bit ahead of schedule and um, we should be able to pace our class um, pretty well tomorrow morning. Um, I'm looking forward to your comments and I hope you guys have a great evening. Thank you very much. I also have the article available uh, as a link on the model, everyone. Thank you, Aiden.